22 of, Ac- of Isaiah chapter 1, but this section is verses 21 through 23, where the Lord's challenge is to contrast Jerusalem's past with its present. <clears throat> and in verse 21, how is the faithful city become a harlot? It is full of judgment and righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. So here's a city that was once faithful to God, a place where justice, righteousness resided. But now then, the city has played the harlot, and murderers reside there. Uh, So a great contrast as to the past in relationship to the present. And while I won't spend time on this, you could say much the same thing about our nation today, couldn't you? It was a place where moral standards were upheld to now then a nation of being amoral, no morals whatsoever. So in verse 22, which is where we had gotten to, Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. So here he's showing the state of degradation. It was like the nation Israel was like silver. Uh, something that is of value. Uh, I don't know what the value of an ounce of silver is today, but uh, uh, people still mine for it and still search for it. Why? Because it has a value to it. It's something that is of value. When you melt it, you can separate then the dross, which is worthless, from the silver. That's how you get the 99.9999999, you know, uh, and all of those other nines that follow after it. Uh, Pure silver. Well, that's getting rid of all of the dross, the worthless part. But now then, he's saying, here's Israel, They were like silver, but now then they're the worthless part. They've just become dross. And so they are worthless. Then he uses the illustration of wine diluted with water. Uh, And just as a, a statement about wine itself, Um, in the Bible, whether you're dealing with the Old Testament or New Testament, wine is generally a general term that can refer to anything from the juice that is still in the grape all the way to an alcoholic beverage. Context determines which. So this is not saying, and when you read wine, don't read it as our thinking. Read it as the biblical aspect. It's not talking necessarily about alcohol. doesn't have to be any alcoholic content. And I would add, don't let people deceive you into thinking that they did not have ways to keep uh, grape juice from fermenting. They did. They had a multitude of ways. Um, And I'm not going to get into those, but uh, I think it's uh, Zondervan pictorial dictionary or something like that that lists about 14 different ways in which they had to uh, preserve wine or preserve grape juice without it fermenting. So 
Right, John, the second chapter. In fact, I think I can prove that it's not alcoholic. Um, but that's another subject. This is a comparison between the former state where it was pure wine to now then it is diluted with water. Uh, the water here of no value, the wine of something of value. Well, their value has become diluted to where it's now, again, using the idea of the dross, worthless. That's the way the city has become. Why? Because it's played the harlot. Well, there's murderers in it. In verse two. They had polluted God's word. They didn't even know God's word anymore. That was the problem. Um, they had become spiritually ignorant. And Isaiah mentions that later on in the book. Uh, verse 23 then, The princes are rebellious and companion of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. He now turns in this verse to the leaders of the people. While he has in the other two verses that we just noted, he's dealt with the nation as a whole, or the people as a whole. Now then, this is dealing specifically with leaders. They are rebellious, uh, and they have no regard for the needy. That's why he's saying in this verse. Uh, they are rebellious people. They de don't care what God says. They're going to go their own way no matter what. Uh, we probably all know individuals who are very simply rebellious. They have a rebellious attitude, a rebellious spirit. It might be not just from the standpoint of religion. It might be in other areas, a rebellious attitude. Now then, I would say that a rebellious attitude in other areas is going to make its way into the aspect from religion. If you have that type of attitude, you're going to have it in relationship to God as well. But we know people who, have, who are just rebellious in uh, their actions and in their attitudes. That's what he's saying the leaders are. Um, and again, could you not compare what uh, he says about their leaders to our leaders today? Uh, and then they have no regard for the needy. Uh, when he talks about everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards... He's talking about taking bribes. It's a nice way of putting, they're taking bribes. Uh, that's what they are seeking, though. And so that's why the, the aspect, they love gifts. Well, what is it? It's a gift to bribe them to, to deprive the needy and to rule in relationship to the righteous, or the rich, I mean. That's taking bribes. Um, and when we look at the prophets, you'll see this time and time again, this type of uh, condemnation of the leaders taking bribes. Uh, they 
are warned time and time again, do not do that because it's going to influence the decisions that you make. You don't believe that? Look at the millions upon millions upon millions of dollars that are spent in the lobbying industry in our nation. What our lobbyists do, they try to offer bribes, except they don't call it that, gifts, to those lawmakers to make sure that what they are lobbying for is passed. That's true, and it is, you know, I, we put it, you, uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. It's a way in which we put it a lot of times, but it is a form of bar- bribery. If you do what I want here, then I'll return the favor over here. Um, but then again, when you get all the lobbyists involved as well, well, then you've got additional problems. <laughs> well, that would be true, uh, except for them, it'd take a whole lot more than a dollar. But the principle, yes. Uh, shaking hands with a dollar in their hand or shaking hands. Uh, yeah, uh, there's that as well. Which, uh, But these leaders, they wanted the gifts. They loved the gifts. In other words, they're going out seeking, hey, I'll do this for you, in a sense if you'll give me such and such. Went right on through customs, huh? <laughs> I um, there's a lot of that type of things that take place in the world uh, if we know about it it's certainly we ought to stay away from it the, to somebody else who would yeah in that type in that situation that's true Yes, with and without any difficulty. Uh, also, notice in this that they are the companion of thieves. Does that uh, make you think of any passage of scripture, maybe in the New Testament? Well, that's taking bribes. I'm talking about companion of thieves. No. No. Mm-hmm. Matthew 21, 13. Yeah. And well, that's what uh, Paul was saying too, uh, that you've made my house a den of thieves. But no, that's not what I was thinking of. No, y'all are, y'all are stuck on the thieves part. Go to the companion of them. This is a, notice that, it is a companion of thieves. 
No, they weren't companions of thieves themselves. They would have been the thieves. No, Judas was the thief in that situation. Can anybody remember what 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says? Okay. That's what you meant to say, right? <laughs> A companion of thieves. Doesn't mean that they were thieves, but they were associating with thieves. That's who they were in cahoots with, as we might put it. it Romans one thirty two have pleasure in them that do them. That would also apply, yes. It's the association, though, that I was getting at. These were a companion of thieves. They associated with those type of individuals. We need to be careful as to who we associate with. In this situation, their association with these resulted in their taking bribes. What if they had associated with the righteous instead of with thieves? That's the point. It's the association that's being discussed here. Not that they themselves were thieves, but they were companions of thieves. They associated with them. <coughs> Be careful as to who you associate with because that association will rub off on you. What term is that in the use in the one where evil companion or evil whatever? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, first Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Or in the various ways in which it's translated. Um But basically, our companionships are going to have an influence on us. Why is it that God told Israel as they were going into the land of Canaan, destroy all of the nations that reside therein? They would have those nations would influence you to do evil and follow after their gods, and, and especially when you get into the marriage situation, uh, don't intermarry with them. And again, it goes back to the same principle that we're talking about: association. The association will tear you down, will destroy you. So that's why he's talking about here. They were a companion of thieves, and it resulted in their taking bribes. Uh, uh, to a great extent, you can say, look at, a, uh, look at who a person associates with. And that's going to tell you a whole lot about the person themselves. Uh, and young people don't really believe that, and they need to be taught it. <laughs> okay, starting in verse 24 then. <clears throat> Verses 24 through 31 we have the Lord's promised restoration of Jerusalem. <coughs> Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and by the way, since uh, y'all can see that, maybe, uh, the word Lord, first word Lord there, saith the Lord, that would be the Hebrew word Adonai. When it's capped like this, the Lord of hosts, it's Yahweh. So he uses the two different terms. Therefore saith 
the Lord, Adonai. Adonai uh, deals with the aspect of uh, well, it's it's should be translated Lord Adonai. It is someone who is a master. It is com- uh, Lord, master, ruler. Isn't Yahweh, like Yahweh. It can be pronounced Yahweh. It can. Uh, it used to be pronounced Jehovah. It's um, either way, depending on who you read. Some of them, like I have, interchange it. <laughs> I'll use Jehovah one time and Yahweh the next. Same thing. It is, uh, and there's great discussion and about it, but. Uh, Basically, it indicates existing or existing one. Um, when uh, and I don't remember the passage. I remember more the quote than the passage uh, that you have not known me as Yahweh or Jehovah, but now then you will, it was because they did not experience the promises prior to it, but now then they were existing. It was, he is the, but in relationship to God, he is the existing one. He has always existed. Um, It is closely akin to that statement, I am that I am. Or I am statements of Jesus. When Jesus says, I am, he's associating himself with that word, Yahweh, or Jehovah. And he's saying, that's who I am. Uh, (laughs) I wish there was some other way that I knew to express that other than using the term I am again. But he's saying, I am. That is, Yahweh. I am. Yeah, I am that I am. Yeah. I'm the only one that exists. I'm the existing one. And that goes back to the very meaning of the term Yahweh. Um, And that's what I was getting to actually when Jesus uses those I am statements. He's going back to Exodus 3 when God says to Moses, I am that I am. He is the existing one. He is Jehovah or Yahweh. But that's the way you can tell there the two different terms, uh, Lord and then Lord. Um, But therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, uh, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. And I will turn my hand unto thee and and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward they shall be called the city of righteousness, the fateful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. uh, For they shall be... Ashamed of their of the oaks which they have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. Uh, for ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. And the strong shall be as a toe, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. 
So, again, this section, a promised or the Lord's promised restoration of Jerusalem. In verse 24, now we've seen how they have become wicked and totally evil. Now then, there's a restoration that's in the future. Verse 24, Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, oh, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. God is now considering or considers Judah as his adversaries or enemies. That's the enemies that he's talking about here. It's Israel. It's Judah, the southern kingdom. They're his enemies. Why? Well, because they've forsaken righteousness and they've done evil. They played the harlot. And his patience has come to an end. And it's going to find re he is going to find relief in punishing them. Our Lord is a patient being. Uh, Lord's not uh, one who immediately punishes. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. But his patience eventually comes to an end. Um, and in the context of 2 Peter 9 that we just quoted, uh, you have God's patience coming to an end, even there. And the fact that he's going, the second coming and God's going to judge the world. And this, this earth and all of the things therein be destroyed. What is it? His patience will come to an end. But he is patient. So he had to destroy man. Because his patience had come to an end. He, and when it says that it repenteth him, um, I think America, uh, New King James and American Standard uses the word uh, is remorseful or words of that effect. It's not dealing with what we think of biblical repentance. It is an aspect of sorrow or remorse. Uh, he's sorry for the state that man has degenerated into. Uh, and so understand the use of the term repent there. But yes, his patience came to an end. Uh, you can see that. I, I mean, it just all through the Bible. God is patient, but it comes to an end. Uh, at the flood. How many years between the time in which he revealed to Noah and the flood taking place? 120 years. Uh, remember when God tells Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, but what? It's not going to be to you, it's going to be to your descendants. Why? Okay, the iniquity or the sin of the Amorites is not full yet. In other words, he's being patient with them. Um, but they couldn't find ten righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. What about Jonah? Why yet forty days, and none of us shall be destroyed? Give them time. God's patient with them, and they repented, and He spared them. Uh, generally, they don't repent. But God is patient. There it is. He's been patient with Judah. Um, the northern kingdom, Israel, the kingdom split when? 
at the death of Solomon, which would have been what year? If you have that paper, uh, you have it, I think. Um, 507? Close. Doesn't it have it on there? I see a few people looking. Doesn't have it on there? I guess not, since nobody's answering. I can't find it. I think it's about 970 uh, that the kingdom divided, death of Solomon. But from that time to what, time, what was the date of the Israel's destruction? Seven twenty-two. That's uh, Judah, southern kingdom. Israel, northern kingdom. Seven twenty-two. Uh, you have a lot of years there, don't you? How many of the kings were righteous? Of the northern kingdom and Israel, none. Zero. Think God was patient with them? <laughs> Why didn't he destroy them back there when Jeroboam changed the, all of those aspects of the worship? Because God was patient with them. You can say the same thing about the southern kingdom Judah. Finally, though, it comes to an end in 586 when he finally destroys the city of Jerusalem. But his patience comes to an end. And God is, here it's saying forth the idea that God is going to be, find relief, the ease of mine adversaries, or I will ease me of my adversaries. I'm finding relief, How? By bringing in judgment upon them, by destroying them or punishing them. That's how he's finding relief. So verse 25, And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all, all thy tin. God's grace... The idea of turn my hand upon thee, through God's grace, he's going to purify them. Now then, in purifying them, he's going to punish the wicked. The dross. Purge away thy dross. Well, we mentioned earlier in relationship to silver, you melt it. The dross comes to the top, and you wipe it away to have the pure silver. The dross was worthless, has no value. Well, he's going to purge away the dross. He's punishing them, punishing the wicked. Um, take away all thy tin. Uh, same type of an attitude here, that which is of no value. Now then, in the context in which he's setting this forth, the dross and the tin are God's enemies that he's going to find relief by punishing them. He's going to ease himself of his adversaries. Who's the adversaries? Those that he describes here as dross and tin. Those who are worthless, those who have lived in sin. So in verse 26, And I will restore the judges 
as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the fateful city. Now, a few minutes ago, we talked about the degeneracy of the judges. They associated with thieves, and as a result of that, they took bribes. Well, that degeneracy that shows itself in the rulers, the judges, and counselors, as mentioned here in this verse, is also going to be seen now in the restoration of those rulers. They were cheating the poor and the needy. Justice is going to be restored. Uh, restore the judges, thy judges, as at the first. Well, they had justice and ruled with justice. They allowed evil to take over restoration of the justice in the land. So it's going to be restored as in the past. And Jerusalem is going to be known as the city of righteousness and faithful to God. If you remember, let me go back a few verses. Uh, Verse 21, how has the faithful city become what? Harlot. Now then, that city, same city he's talking about that has become a harlot, but now then what? The city of righteousness, the faithful city. That's what it's going to be called. That's restoration. Um, To get gold, and you have to get it real hot. You have to melt it down totally in order, and completely, even the center core, in order to get the dross out of it, the worthless aspect out of it. So a lot of heat, a lot of effort to get rid of the dross. Well, here there's the effort that's going to be is God's going to punish the and take away the wicked. Okay, uh, that your faith being tried as of gold uh, and being purified through that persecution that you're going to be the fiery trials that are going to overtake you. First Peter one. It takes a lot of digging and a lot of uh, in order to get a little bit of gold. Uh, so it does take a great deal of material in order to get the gold. The small remnant again that is of value. While this verse and the following verses might have an immediate fulfillment in the return from Babylonian captivity, um, and again, we're dealing with Jerusalem here, so the destruction of Jerusalem was by whom? Who destroyed it? No, that's later on. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They are then allowed to return in 536 under Cyrus's decree. Well, at that return, there's that a partial fulfillment of what Isaiah is prophesying here. Um uh, it's interesting, and we'll probably mention this a few times through Isaiah, that after the return from Babylonian captivity, 
there is no recorded record of Israel going after any other gods, going into idolatry. Um, plenty of it prior to that time, but... Uh, so there is a partial fulfillment in that, but the ultimate fulfillment of this would be what? The city of righteousness and the faithful city? Okay, the church. That would be brought in by the gospel, but it's dealing with the church primarily. That's the ultimate fulfillment. Again, it might have this immediate fulfillment in the return from captivity there under Cyrus, under Cyrus's decree, that is. But it, the primary ultimate fulfillment deals with the church. The church is a place where righteousness exists. Now, what is righteousness? Doing right. Doing right. How do we know what right is? All of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Romans 1, 16 and 17. So, a city of righteousness is dealing with a city that is doing what God says, doing all of God's commands. Um, and also a faithful city. Well, faithful, again, you're dealing with some a city, the church, being faithful to God, doing what God says again, doing all of his commands and living in faithfulness to him. Now, that's the church. And it's a very beautiful description of the church. Um, so this is ultimately fulfilled in the church. And we look to the church for that ultimate fulfillment. Even though it would have an immediate response in relationship to Israel, the primary would be in relationship to the church. I'll wait about verse 27, that Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness because Andrew's ringing the bell now. So we'll start there, Lord willing, next week. Next week.